The title of this story I'm going to read is A Time to Love. In April, when the cricket sang incessantly, when the rice harvest was celebrated with drinking tuba at the end of the day, and the smell of roasted green rice filled the night air while young folks danced it tinkling under the light of the full moon, Erminia's thoughts would always go back to the time when she herself was young, when her heart was full of hope and her life was still an empty canvas on which to create her own memories. It was only in April that she would allow herself to remember everything. Only in April that she would indulge herself with the memories of her lost love. Because in April, with so much gaiety around her, with everyone in the village happy and content, with their stomachs full again, she knew that at last she, would, she could afford to remember her pain and know that she would not sink into it that she would not lose her mind from the sheer agony of her sorrow. The spirit of the world and the joy of the people around her would hold her up, would sustain her and keep her safe. Only in April could she come home to her true self, confront her pain, and be truly honest with herself. The rest of the year, she busied herself with being a school teacher being a dutiful daughter, and being the parental sister to all her siblings. On this hot, sparkling afternoon, as she walked alone from helping with the rice harvest, she was crossing the bridge on her way home when she glanced at the bay to her left. The shore on one side was lined with houses, many of them on stilts with fat snipper roofs and some wooden ones with the second story. There were two more blocks up against the hillside that she could not see, yet she knew every house and every family that lived in this barrio. Between the two shores facing each other, she could see the horizon of endless blue. If one could fly straight in that direction, one would end up eventually in America. America is where my love is, she mused to herself. She stopped at the phrase, my love. Am I still his love? Does he ever still think of me? There was a half smile on her lips as she remembered that April of many years ago when he first told her that he loved her. No. In those days, people didn't say, I love you. He told her that he had applied to go to California. Would she like to go with him? She remembered how stunned she had been at this proposal. She was going on 23 and had just started teaching at the Barrios Elementary School. What did he expect her to say? She was concerned that the people around them would notice that they were talking having a private conversation. All she could think of was that he was talking to her in the wrong place. And during this time, she was so disturbed by the impropriety of their talking in a public place that the meaning of what he had just said was lost to her. She felt a sense of panic. And in that moment, it seemed that the bamboo dancers were suspended in air as they hopped over the bamboo adeptly avoiding being hit by the poles while two people clapped the poles together, tap, tap, twice on the ground, and then crack as the poles, as they clapped them together, uh, and then back again to the ground. The singers sang soundlessly, and the whole scene of gaiety was frozen in front of her while his eyes searched hers, waiting. The full moon shone brightly against the cloudless sky. It was a perfect night for the young people to gather together, eating pilipic, the sweet-smelling roasted young rice, and to test their dancing skills with the moving bamboo poles, while everyone else seated on logs sat around and sang as they challenged the dancers. When she recovered from her shock, the sounds of the evening came back, and the dancers and the singers all became alive again around her. 
She looked sharply at him. He had never spoken to her of his love. He always greeted her politely when they happened to meet during gatherings. She suspected that he liked her, and so did her friends, who sometimes teased him about him. But now he was asking her such a ludicrous question. Was he joking? What impertinence. Since when did he think he could joke around with me? At last she recovered her speech, but all she could say was that this was neither the time nor the place to ask such a question. She felt affronted and insulted. He read her body language and apologized. Erminia, I am not permitted to visit you. How else can I tell you but this way? She was surprised. She was not aware that he had asked her parents for permission to visit her. Three times in the last year and a half, he told her. I know that your parents don't think I'm worthy of you. That's why I'm going to the States. I'm going to make a living, a better one than I could ever find here. Then go, she said. She was angry. Why, she could not understand. Now remembering, she knew why. It was because she was scared. May I write to you then? She did not answer. Instead, she got up from her seat on the log and walked to her cousin, Christina, and told her that she wanted to go home. Christina was not yet ready to go home, but she did not argue. She, too, rose from her seat on the big log, and they walked home together. Christina was spending the night at her home. Apparently, her no answer was taken as a yes. He wrote to her, but not until July when school started. He addressed the letters to the school where she taught. At first, he only kept her abreast of the developments of his application. It was going to take three months for the application for the approval to come. No visa was required because the country was the Commonwealth of the United States. It would take as much time to get his passport, but more importantly, he needed money from the rice harvest and later from the sale of the copra the dried coconut meat, which was converted into coconut oil. He was going to have to work hard before he could accumulate the money for his passage. In spite of herself, she, found, she realized that she liked him. Felipe was quiet, polite, and sincere. She was sure now that his intentions were honorable. She found herself thinking of him a lot. It was she finally, who asked for permission for him to visit her at her home. She smiled at the memory. The young folks of today have no idea what it was like 50 years ago. She thought of Felipe sitting straight back on one of the chairs in the sala, which people now call the living room. Her Aunt Cornelia, or sometimes her mother, would sit on another chair, and she next to the chaperone. He knew to stay for only one hour and not a minute more. How they suffered through that, yet it was a joy to see him. At that time, she knew of no other way, no other way to see him. His impending trip to America was suspect and frowned upon. Erminia's parents completely disapproved. His promise was that he would return after five years. The promise and the dream was that he would come back with enough money to afford a respectable wedding and with enough to spare to build a house. He was true to his promise. After five long years, he returned, his pockets full of money, but there was a change in his plans. He wanted Erminia to go with him to the States after the wedding. By this time, her uncle had been appointed judge in the municipal court. Her parents, opposed to the match from the very beginning, deferred to him for the final decision. He, her uncle told Herminia not to go with Felipe, that in fact, there should be no wedding. He told her that she had to stay in San Isidro to take care of her mother when she became old. <coughs> it was not right to marry someone who would take her away from her duties as a daughter. Felipe was desperate. He had high hopes. He thought that his visit to his home would bring the fulfillment of his dreams, that he would be married to Erminia at last, the woman he had dreamed of this past five years. 
Come with me, he pleaded. We will build a life together, a life different from this, a life with more possibilities, a life where we could be free from the limitations of the barrio. She was uncertain. This is the only li life I've known, Felipe. This is not the only life to live, he pleaded. You could go to graduate school. You are a smart woman. I earn a good salary. I could support you. Please, Erminia, think about it. I would be disobeying my, disobeying my parents if I went with you now that they have said I should not go. Would you not go for love's sake? You, should, you said you love me. Isn't that reason enough to go? Yes, you have my heart, but I have a duty towards my parents. My younger brothers and sisters will need me to support them through school. The rice fields don't yield enough to send four more children to school, to college. Erminia, you could earn much more money in America than you would here. You could send them the money. I give you my word I will help with the expenses of your brother's education. She remembered looking at him then and recognizing his sincerity, his earnestness, the greatness of his love. She re remembered how at that moment, how stricken she was with grief as she realized that much as Felipe loved her and much as she loved him, she could not have his love. She would have to stay here in San Isidro. I believe you, Felipe but you're asking me for something I cannot give. What is it that you cannot give? She remembered pausing, not sure what to say, how to say what she was going to say next. They had so little time together. It was merciful of Aunt Cornelia to leave them alone that night. Her parents were not at home. This could be their last conversation. Would he understand? Would he stop loving her after this? Felipe, please hear me. I want to be with you, but I can't go against their wishes. I can't go with you without their blessing. I can't give up my honor and be able to live with myself. Your honor. You would give up our love for your honor. Your heart is cruel, Erminia, but I can't force you. I just want you to know that I will always love you. I will love you till I die. Even if you were to marry someone else, I will seek you out. I will always want to be with you. You do understand that. You do understand that I can't have a life here. I can't give up a good living that I earn in California and have nothing to offer you if I were to live here. I need to go back, but I will return. Through all these years, she still remembers the stab in her heart as she felt that she felt as she watched him leave. She had no right to detain him. She could not gi give any promises. Her faith had been written and she was helpless. She could not change it. Remembering all these things now, she realized how foolish she had been. There was no way to reverse her story, no change, nor change it. Here she was at the age of 68. Both her parents dead for a long time. All her younger brothers done with their studies and successful in their professions. She had done her duty and left her honor intact. But what did she have for her efforts? Are her memories enough? In April, this was what she did. Remember. Remember and suffer all over again. She had thought that she would die, but she survived somehow. She busied herself with teaching, overseeing the rice fields and the sale of the coconut products. She saw her siblings through school. She saw her parents through their illnesses and then their deaths. No one ever mentioned Felipe again. To them, he was like an illusion that was there, but not really there. But to her, the pain in her heart was too real to deny. Her love was real. She heard that he had gotten married, but she did not hear from him directly. She always avoided thinking of the what ifs. There was no need to torture herself further. She wondered about that as she rounded the bend. Why couldn't she face one single fantasy about him? Was it because of fear? 
What would have happened if she had eloped with him 45 years ago? She remembered herself in her youth, her slim body, her heavy black long hair braided at the back. They would have made a lovely couple, she thought, remembering him, his handsome face, his easy smile, and how tall and slim he was. She remembered how he looked at her, the unmistakable light of love in his eyes. Did she ever tell him that she loved him too? Once she crossed the bridge, she could almost, thank you, she could almost see her house. She now owned the house that her parents had built. Now as she glanced ahead, she noticed a group of people crowding around something in her house. Surprise and fear caused her heart to bang in her chest. It was a car, a shiny black car. Who could be waiting at her house? Old Nana and Marta, the woman who cooked for her and did her laundry, was home. Erminia hoped that she had given such an illustrious visitor a proper welcome. A boy, seeing her, came running towards her with the news. Mana Erminia, you have a visitor. We don't know his name, but he came in a car. Yes, Bo Boy, I can see that. Bo Boy, would you please come with me? I am going to your house. Is your mother home? Yes, she's there. Come with me to your house then. We might need you. Bo Boy, perplexed, followed her. He was disappointed that he could not go back to admire the car with his friends. Erminia had to retrace her steps to go to Bo Boy's house. She was relieved to find his mother. Ines, she said in a soft voice, there is someone at our house who came in a car. I can't possibly meet him looking like this. Would you please do me a favor? Sure, she said, completely understanding. Erminia's, completely understanding Erminia's problem. If she knew in anything, she did not let on. What would you like me to do? Erminia gave her precise instructions to go to her house and fetch her some fresh clothes. Then she asked permission to bathe herself in Ines's pantal. Ines showed her to the covered porch next to the kitchen where a jar of cool water awaited her. She handed Erminia a towel and left the boy to go to Erminia's house. When she came back, Erminia was waiting. She quickly got into her clothes and noticed that Ines, or was it Nana and Marta, had picked out her favorite blue dress with the white flower prints which made her look young and slim. She worried about her hair for a moment, but decided to just wear it as it was, wet and dripping on her shoulders after she'd combed it out. She thanked Ines and walked to her house accompanied by Boboy. The crowd parted to let her through. Some greeted her with a respectful, good afternoon, Miss Texun. She smiled at them and recognized her students from years ago. They must be in college now if they had continued with their studies. She had lost track of many of them. There was an urge in her to walk quietly, to tiptoe if possible. Who was this guest? Her parents had died quite a while ago. Could this person be looking for them? Nana and Marta met her at the top of the stairs. Erminia could not read the expression on her face, which was a mixture of joy and, what was it, a begging look, as if she were begging her to be patient. Erminia looked beyond her to the sala, the living room, and saw the back of a gray-haired man. Her heart skipped a beat. There she hoped. The man turned around when he heard her footsteps. She stopped right in her tracks. For what seemed an eternity, they stared at each other, while Nala and Marta watched, her hands clasped together at her throat as if in prayer. Erminia, he said at last, and he came forward and gathered her in his arms. Erminia was speechless. She did not resist this man's grip around her back. She stood there as though she had been turned to stone. At last, he loosened his embrace and studied her face. You are beautiful, he said. You're just the way I have imagined you. 
Her thoughts were just were going wild. Why did no one ever tell me? She screamed inside. Why did no one ever tell me that love does not die? She had imagined that when she saw him again, the years would have changed her feelings, her April musings notwithstanding. But here she was, her knees weak and wobbly, her heart palpitating love with each beat. She found her voice finally, but she was crying. Felipe, is it really you? Yes, it's me, your Felipe, Erminia. I have come for you again, but this time no one is going to stop us. He led her to the rattan sofa, sat her down with him next to her, his arm around her shoulder. But you're married, she said, her voice soft. She died five years ago. It took me a while to settle, to settle our estate before I could leave. Now I am here, Erminia. Will you come with me this time? Erminia knew with all the wisdom she had gained through the years that the answer was yes, 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 a thousand times. She let him hold her, his arms wrapped around her. They sat on the sofa, their eyes on each other. They sat in silence, a long, eloquent silence. At last she had him, and they would never part again. Forgive me, she spoke. My darling, there's nothing to forgive. I have a question. Is this based on anything that's true? <laughs> well, the real Erminia, or the woman from whom I um, borrowed this persona is now a 92-year-old woman, and she never married. But, well, one day I was in a doctor's office, and, I op and there was a Bible, and I never opened Bibles in doctor's offices. But this time I opened it, and it was right on the page of the Ecclesiastics. And, and, and there was this, you know, to everything there is a season, there's a time to live and a time to die, time to love and time to have. And I said, a time to love. And it, that phrase never left my mind until I decided that I would write this story, except that, of course, everything is made up. I was not there 50 or 60 years ago. And um, I wanted her to have a happy ending. <laughs> The next story, I'm just picking up uh, parts and pieces. There will be a coherence to what I have done, except that I'm not going to tell you how it ends. <laughs> so here I am on my way to Ujung Pandang to be with David. I remember feeling puzzled that both my therapist and my best friend Shirley found it necessary to ask me why I was going. I thought it was a dumb question. Maybe it is not so dumb. Maybe they both see something I don't. All I know is the feeling of urgency to see him, something that cannot wait until the end of August when he comes back home. I look down at the expanse of white clouds below us. I think of David. I smile, but I'm immediately overcome with sadness. My flying Dutchman. I used to call him that when he flew countless times between Amsterdam and New York to be with me whenever he could get away from his teaching job in Leiden. Now I am flying to him. I think about my luggage. I congratulate myself once again for the amazing feat of traveling light, for having packed everything for a two-week trip halfway around the world into a small overnight bag. I think of David's letter, written the first week he was in Ujung Pandang. He's renting a house, but it is small, he said. Don't bring too much if you come. There's no space. It makes me cringe even now. I feel as though he was saying there's no room for me. I resolved to make an effort to shrink, not to occupy too much space. I realize that this is the attitude of the unwelcome. I am suddenly filled with anxiety. What will he say? I made the decision to travel so quickly 
that I have not had time to tell him I'm coming. I hope he likes my surprise visit. Biak is an international airport. That is when she finally arrives. But it is a small one. And so finally, I wonder to where the immigration baggage claim area was, where all the passengers were in my flight are waiting for the luggage. I look for my bag, but it is nowhere to be found. Someone tells me that I will probably find it at my final destination, so I don't worry about it anymore. In Ujung Pandang, I disembarked from the DC-9 in which we flew from Biak, anxious to see if my, bag, my little bag is in. It is not. I inquire about the procedures for claiming lost luggage. I am told to call a certain number. I write it on a piece of paper and put it in my bag's side pocket. Luckily, I have my cosmetics, soap, a washcloth, and allergy and diarrhea medication in the bag I am carrying. The taxi driver has trouble finding David's address when we arrive at the district after a half hour. He stops several times to ask people along the way. They point him towards the right direction, and finally, we find the street. It is in a newly developed neighborhood behind the university campus. David's housekeeper, a woman in her 50s wearing a gaily colored batik skirt tied around her waist, her hair knotted up into a bun at the back of her head, meets me at the door. But David is not home. He's not in town, she says. When she finds out that I am his wife, she welcomes me in, flutters around me with her attention, calling me by the honorific name, which means mother. Would Evo like to eat lunch, or would Evo like to shower first? But David is going to be away for another week. Another week, I say with great dismay. I try to get out of her all the information I need. She does not remember exactly where he was going and why. Finally, she takes out a piece of paper on which David had written the name of a guest house in Batu Tumango. I look for Batu Tumango in a map of Celibis on the wall. It is not too far from a town called Rantipao. I am relieved to say that there's a telephone. I call the airport. There is a Mirpati flight to Rantipao at 5 in the afternoon, the man on the phone says. I want to reserve a seat. You have to go to the airport to do that, the man on the phone says. I want to scream at him that we are in the 90s, for heaven's sakes. Why can't I make a reservation on the phone? But I know it's pointless to argue. He reassures me that there are seats left. I tell the housekeeper that I'm going to where David is. I eat a quick meal of fried fish, rice, a delicious vegetable dish, red leaves cooked in coconut milk. Then I ask the housekeeper to find me a taxi. The taxi takes me to a clothing store downtown. It is busy with people. I head directly towards the women's wear department, and after 20 minutes, I was done with the shopping. In Rantipao, the Bandar Odara Pangtiko Airport, I discovered that to get to Batu Tumangu, I had to take a BIMO, a small bus, from Rantipao, but that at this time, there are no more BIMOs going there. A taxi driver offers to take me to Wisma Maria, a hotel in Rantipao, which he is sure has vacancies. It turns out to be comfortable and pretentious little hotel with a few European tourists. I am thankful for the snack of sandwiches served during the flight. I feel relieved to be able to take a shower and settle in bed. I immediately fall asleep. I wake up early, refreshed and ready for adventure. I am suddenly overcome with nostalgia and I realize that I miss David. I wish for a moment that I were doing this trip with him, but I tell myself that soon we will be together. The hotel people are very kind and, and helpful. They had their van take me to the bus station where I would find a BIMO going to Batu, Tumango. They tell me that the roads are not very good, so the bigger buses do not go, but the BIMOs do a good job of providing transportation up to the mountains. What they did not tell me is that it is a hair-raising drive. 
but I am easily distracted from the dangers by the spectacular views. The narrow dirt road slides like a snake around the mountainside. At times it seems that the bimal is headed straight into a sheer drop, but then solid run appears as we turn around a bend. The panorama of green and gold is fantastic. At one point, there is a whole expanse of rice terraces as far as one can see in both directions. The whole valley rises gently onto the mountains, all terraced to accommodate the rice fields, golden and ready for harvest. Even at this early hour, I can see that people have already done a lot of work. All along, the people are carrying harvested rice stalks home. Some carry them in baskets tied to the end of poles balanced on their shoulders. Others carry sheaves of rice stalks bundled together and tied at both ends of the pole. The Bemo driver recognizes the name of the guest house. He points to a spot at the next mountain peak. The hotel, he says. Suddenly we feel a bump and we hear a dog yelp. The driver stops the vehicle and he goes out to look. He has, had, he has hit a dog. I am horrified. What shocks me the most is the glee with which the other passengers meet the news of this accident. The driver shouts something at a woman on the road. They exchange a short conversation and the woman hands him a burlap bag. And the driver packs the dead dog into it and throws the sack onto the back of the bimo. Some people laugh. I am frustrated at not being able to understand the language that they are speaking. God, I think to myself, suddenly realizing what is happening. They don't eat dogs here, do they? They must. They continue to talk happily, laughing at some joke I am not a part of. I struggle not to throw up. As we approach the hotel, I can see that it is composed of three thatched roofed buildings that sit on the ground. The middle one is right on the edge of the cliff. It is open on three sides. When I enter, I recognize it to be the dining area. Here I find the proprietor. He looks somewhat surprised when I tell him I'm looking for David. He hesitates at first, but soon he shows me to David's room which is in the building to the left of the restaurant registration area. I knock at the door. Yes, a man's voice, not David's, calls out. It is I, Sophia, I answer. The door opens. The man is wearing a silk robe, a deep maroon with blue trim. He is tall, about six feet four, blonde and he has the clearest blue eyes I have ever looked into. European, I think to myself. He too, like the hotel proprietor, looks surprised. I'm sorry, I say, I'm looking for David van der Meer. The proprietor must have made a mistake. Hi, he says, I'm Steven. No, old Pa Bandi did not make a mistake. This is David's room. Then he extends his hand to shake mine. I'm pleased to meet you, Sophia, he says, with a kind smile in his eyes. Hey, Dave, he calls to the bedroom. You've got a surprise. Yes, it is indeed a surprise. He, I say, he doesn't know I'm coming. I now feel somewhat in command of myself again. I walk toward the bedroom door. It opens just then, and David, fresh from a shower, comes out. I see a glimpse of the bedroom inside. There's a king-size bed, the sheets all rumpled, the bedspread lying carelessly on the floor. David closes the door behind him and looks at me incredulously. What are you doing here, He's, he asks. Don't just stand there and stare, I say, laughing and crying at the same time. Aren't you going to give him a hug? I walk into his arms and he holds me for a while. No one speaks. The rest is up to you. <laughs> I forgot to tell you the title of that story is um, They Don't Eat Dogs Here, Do They?
I'm just wondering, you know, what was the time? Obviously, the first story happened like in the 50s. Um, I think no. That story happened in probably the 20s or the 30s because that was the time when the Philippines was a commonwealth oh, okay. of the United States. So it, it really happened quite a while back. And then the second story that's more modern. Right? This is more recent. He, she said, for heaven's sakes, we're in the 90s. Oh, yeah, okay. That's right. So this was um, supposedly in the 90s. Because in the first story, you know, how sacrificial she was, really, just to be able to send her siblings to school. That is still happening today. Yeah. You know, there is another form of sacrifice that a lot of Filipino women are doing nowadays. They go abroad, they go to Kuwait, they go to Saudi Arabia, and they send all the money that they earn back home. Yeah. I'm assuming those two stories might take place in different places, different islands, or? Um, the first story is set um, the, in this fictitious town called San Isidro. But actually, it's sort of like the twin town of uh, uh, my father's hometown, which is in reality called San Julian. But this woman is from a barrio called Pagbabangnan. I don't mention that. Yeah, and, and the other story happens in Indonesia. Yeah. Have you written these stories before? I think the first fiction that I ever wrote was when I was in fifth grade. <laughs> and um, I still remember the title, When My Grandmother Ran Away. <laughs> I have no idea about anything about my grandmother, but I did a very colorful story about how she ran away on horseback. <laughs> so I have been writing stories, but the, the, my very first serious stories were written when we lived in Hamburg. What year was that? Yes, and I had nothing else to do. So that was how I started finally writing seriously. And these written, uh, stories are written over that period of time. And I have another volume that I'm working on of stories that are from the viewpoint of a little girl. And then I have to work on an, a third volume because not all of my stories got accommodated into this volume here. So I have another group of stories that I think also needs to be in, in print. <laughs> yeah, so I just hope that I have the strength to do that. How long did it take you from the beginning to produce this book, to write this book? I was just telling somebody here that um, <coughs> right after I started writing seriously in 2001, but none of those first stories are here in this volume. So I, um, I started, I, I worked as a psychotherapist all my life, and, um, and I think uh, writing was a way of sort of like, what's the word, um, debriefing myself, you know, getting back into myself again after a, a day of sessions. And um, so um, I think I would say that I started writing seriously after 2001, and maybe I did find some stories from way back that were earlier and got included here. but. The process itself of writing a story, I would say that first it would be, the story would bang in my head, like the story about a time to love. I had the title, but what, what am I going to, what am I going to write, you know? So it, I, I let a process, there's a process of it banging around in my head, or sometimes it's actually characters that bang around in my head for a while, and I said, but what do you want? What, what, do, I, what do you want me to do with you, you know? And, and then finally, I would sit down and write. And the process of writing could be as little as four hours. 
once I've got it all, I can sit down and write. I, I don't go back, I don't keep going back and say, okay, let me finish the third paragraph or so on. I write and I write and so it was a good thing. He, he's a good sleeper. He doesn't know that I am not in bed by three or four. <laughs> <laughs> by four o'clock in the morning because I'm, I'm hidden away somewhere writing. <laughs>